Thank you very much. I just echo uh, what a difficult uh, thing it is to do to follow such a lovely lunch uh, and, and hope that uh, everybody will stay awake and that everybody can hear me. If I had to retitle my talk or give a further talk, a further codicil to the talk, and of course academics like to have very long titles to their talks, preferably with the use of a colon, if not two, I would retitle the talk Existential Challenges and Existential Responses. Marshall. I'm very pleased, uh, and I want to thank the organizers of the conference for asking me to attend and to be able to present a paper at this gathering. First and foremost, I'm a historian, <clears throat> and I've not really thought too much about what that might entail, what that might mean until pre preparing for this particular paper, but it occurs to me I've never really been asked what a historian does or what a historian is supposed to do. What's a job description? What motivates us, or what do we like to think motivates us and distinguishes us in particular, or supposed to distinguish us from any other academics? And if I were ever asked, I would someday be asked, my daughter asked me when she was very young, and I don't think she took anything away from it at that time, but I'd say something like this. Historians are supposed to tell you, politely to be sure, that the way that we all usually think things happened in the past didn't really happen that way. And we do this with a view to suggesting it was much more complex than we might think today. And because it was different, and possibly even more interesting than most of us think, especially because it was more complex, we cannot take the present, that is what we have and see around us today, for granted. And if we were alive in the past, we'd not really be able to tell what the future was going to be. That's not necessarily to say that the future may not be known, both generally and also in the most minute and intimate details, only that we as human beings on this earth don't know. This would, I think, is fair to say apply to those who would then say that history is aimless, goalless, with no predetermined preset endpoint in sight. The future is, those people might say, what we make of it, what people make of it. Some of these are optimistic about the future, believing that human beings will somehow figure it all out and that things will get better. Some are not, and believe we may end up destroying ourselves. Followers of the three main, what we might call, Abrahamic faiths, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, however, might well say that they are all in a waiting mode. They have this in common, I think, even as they face a myriad of both external and internal challenges. They have an idea of the eventual outcome of history. That is, they might be said to feel that history is not aimless, but in fact is moving in a line. But they don't know the exact details of how they will move from where they are to that final point. Still speaking of these same people, the same might be the case in the past. The faithful of the past all faced, also faced a myriad of internal and external challenges. They too could not in particular foretell the obstacles and challenges that might be faced by their own generation, let alone future generations. They also could not speak with certainty about any particular outcome in detail nor be in any position to know any future events or trends for certain, except the final one. Seems to me then the historian's job might be to unpack or recreate the realities to better understand a range of challenges that people faced in the past, to note that there were different groups of people, and to suggest therefore how different of these peoples reacted to these different internal and external challenges and to sketch out what possible different outcomes there might have been, as opposed to the one which did finally come about. And this we do in order to appreciate better, and here by the word appreciate, I use that word as understand, but also as the faithful might understand it, to be grateful for, the outcome that we see around us today, and perhaps all too often take for granted. Our being where we are today, still on the journey, could not have seemed inevitable to earlier generations, they might have known the end point, but they couldn't have predicted how future generations would arrive there. Indeed, issues that were a prime import in the past probably occupy very little of our attention today, while our forebearers undoubtedly would have had trouble understanding and facing some of the challenges that we today face. So how might a historian, by this possibly very personal definition to be sure, recast the period of the nudge of Allah in order to appreciate this important work but also to offer possibly some comments on its legacy. And I start by then setting the milieu, the atmosphere. By the time of the Buyid period, when the Zaydi Buyids were the military and political power behind the Abbasid Caliphate, and here we're talking the years 
in, if you will, in the Laddie dates, 941 to 1055, the Twelver community had already faced down a great series of challenges to their faith, not only external military and political ones, including the hostility of the Umayyads and the Basid rulers, but internally also the successive, successive fragmentation of the community at the deaths of each of the successive Imams, and the further fragmentation of an already small group of followers at the disappearance of the twelfth Imam. At the death of the 11th Imam, the followers of his brother Jafar may in fact have been the largest of the extant Imami groups. But those who believed that the 11th Imam had a son who had become the Imam at his father's death but then had gone into hiding were but one of many contemporary Shi'i groups and were in fact a very few in number at that. By these very few, however, that Imam was initially expected to return sometime in the natural lifetime. And when he did not, further splits occurred within the community as the period known as al Hayra, the confusion, wore on over the 4th the 10th century. There were even doubts in those years as the true number of the Imams and the times and length of the various periods of his absence referred to in the many statements of the Imams in circulation across the region. But such profound, <coughs> what we today might call existential challenges, called forth profound, that is to say, existential responses. Over the later years of the century, it is clear from examining texts written, <coughs> compiled in the period by such figures as the well-known today as Ibn Babwe, the Sheikh of Sadu, and his many compilations of the Imam's own statements and the statements made about them, it's clear that believers in various pockets of the community scattered across the region that he visited to collect them were beginning, as it were, to come out on the other side of this issue. Ibn Babwe collected statements on the number of the Imams as 12, on the numbers and durations of the Ghaiba, or the Ghaibat, and statements about and even naming various of the Imam spokesmen in the early years following the onset of the Ghaiba. Of course, it's not at all clear that all of his many compilations were immediately available across the region, let alone that many, if not most, believers could access them. Remember in those days that most people did not live in cities, and Ibn Babwe was a city resident. And also that most people were not, in any case, literate. However, his works, and others of the time, do in fact attest to the widespread doubts, and he and others even write about those doubts, even as they also suggest that solutions to those doubts were becoming available. But in a model way, as has been suggested, was a city dweller, mainly based in Rome, then the seat of one of the Buyid emirs. The Buyids were to be sure Zaydis, so in theory they were supposed to be friendly to the Twelve of Faith. But this particular emir was known for his Sunni, and especially his anti-traditionist sympathies. So it took quite some courage for Ibn Babawi, a traditionist par excellence, to continue to work with the texts, and in today's parlance, speak truth to power. Ibn Babawi, though he mentions the places he visited and collected the Imam's traditions, gives us a solid working list of the pockets of the believing community extant across the region. These works, as I say, also reveal the extent to which believers there were gripped by al-Hera, but also in the form of the very traditions he was collecting in these locales, that they also had at their disposal, at their disposal the answers to the challenges that al-Hera generated. And in Babawe was a woman, and in fact spent most of his career and undertook most of his travels in what we might call the Eastern Islamic lands, especially Khorasan, where, as we know, the eighth Imam had spent some time. Great challenges call for great responses. To the West, and especially in Baghdad, the community may be said to have been facing a different series of external and internal challenges that were perhaps more complex and at least as existential in the nature of the ones that were facing the community in the Eastern realms. Of course, we know lots about the 12 or elites of the later years of the Buyid period. The Sheikh Mufi, Sharif al Mutaza, and his famous brother Arazi, known for his assembly of our text. And of course, the student of the first two, Muhammad ibn Hassan, the Tusi. All were based in Baghdad. All are well known today, both among Western scholars, but also among the faithful. And they are usually adjudged to have promoted, to varying degrees, recourse to human-derived tools of analysis and interpretation on a par with, or sometimes even to the relative exclusion of the revealed texts in the interpretation of doctrine and practice. The works of these scholars compose the bulk of the extent primary source materials produced in the remaining years of the Buyid period to the arrival, shall we say, of the Sunni Seljuks and their capture of Baghdad in 1055. Unfortunately, therefore, it's their voices that are privileged in discussions and developments in the Twelver Doctrine and Practice in this period. 
Of course, the extent to which the larger Berlinian community, of which these scholars were identified by the political authorities as leaders, were beset by external challenges is well known. The student or the scholar of the history of the faith in these centuries might be expected, in fact, to find lots of information on the subject in the standard secondary works in English on the Buyids. In fact, however, even in the very most recent book on the Buyids, published by Brill in 2003, the book contains very little information on the Buyids and their faith, let alone 12 or Shi'ism over the period. In fact, by the Buyid period, Baghdad was a well-developed urban center, and its sectarianism was well known and dated, in fact, to the later 800s and early 900s, well before the arrival of the Buyids on the scene. But when scholars come to discuss the sectarianism in the Buyid period, in particular from the 940s on, that is to say, it's only the later Sunni authored accounts of events in the life of the city that are available. And as other Western scholars have depended on these to discuss the religious atmosphere of the period, they have done so rather uncritically. They accept the agenda of these later Sunni sources, which agenda suggests that really the Buyids only exacerbated Baghdad's sectarianism. By contrast, in these later texts, the Sunni caliphs, especially Al-Qadr, for example, are portrayed as defenders of the faith, and especially the traditionalism of the Sunni popular classes. In the process, these later Sunni sources do refer to very nearly continuous sectarian tensions in the city across the period. From 946 to 961, for example, if one picks these apart, one can see the Sunnis plundering the larger Shi'i Kark quarter, setting afire the Shi'i Babatak quarter, and much sectarian strife, actually forcing the government to send in troops and banish some Shia from the city. Riots in the 990s forced cancellations of ceremonies commemorating Muharram. In 1017, Al-Qadr banned discussion of Shi'i and Mutazili doctrines. In 1018, he denounced the Mutazili view of the Quran and affirmed the caliphate of the first three caliphs and dismissed the preacher of the Shi'i Baratha Mosque. In 1031, Sunnis blocked the path of Homi pilgrims to Kufa, and later, with Turkish elements, attacked Kar. In 1049, Ashura commemorations generated riots. In 1051, Sunnis attacked Kar yet again, and the graves of the two imams, Musa and Mama Jawad, and Akazamein as well. The Sunni soldiers were approaching, and in 1053-54, just before they approached, there are reports of further conflict inside the city. But the Sunni sources that Western scholars reference when referring to this Baghdad-based strife in these years include sources written in the 13th century, Ibn Najawzi, who died in 1201, Ibn Othir, who died in 1233, and Ibn Kathir, who died in 1373, hundreds of years later. When today we can acknowledge that even events of 20 years ago were subject to different recollections, let alone different interpretations, and this in the age of the internet, Imagine the discrepancies that, that some three centuries may engender for the understanding of the daily life in Buya Baghdad. <clears throat> Nevertheless, and read carefully, we look for patterns without necessarily accepting all the details. The sources do, success, do suggest that there were grievances against the wealthy, underlying some of the period's discontent, hunger, famine, sheep merchants being attacked, dissension over the authentic version of the Quran, whether the Othmanic Codex was in fact the Quran. And it was very often the same 12 elites with whose work we're very familiar, who were held responsible by the court for the actions of other popular elements within the Shi'i community. Mufid himself, though uninvolved in many of these clashes, was banished from the city one, at least twice, if not three times, for example. The occasion for one of these banishments appears to have been to, the disorders which followed the appearance of uh, the so-called Ibn Mas'ud recension, a Shi'i version of the Quran. And Sunni, Sunni scholars are said to have ordered the text burned. The, Sun, the Caliph himself sent Sunni bands into the Shi'i quarters, and Sunni and Shi'i notables, I'm sorry, and merchants were publicly forced to apologize to the Caliph. And again, Mufid was banished. Mufid was banished in 1019 after other riots. Popular elements in 1025 set fire to al Murtaza's house and most of Kar. Again, if the dates and aspects of these exact details are problematic, the broad outlines do suggest that there was some strife and chaos, and sectarian chaos was exacerbated within the community. So, the Sunni sources, the later Sunni sources, depict Buyid Baghdad as continuously racked by sectarian conflict. But, we also know that in fact court-based patronage over the period ensured that Baghdad and provincial courts and centers in modern-day Iran, for example, Hamdan, Isfahan, Reis, Shiraz, Nishapur, Bukhara, as well as Basra and Aleppo, were also centers of vibrant intellectual life. 
Religious scholars and poets flocked to and traveled between these centers. They served as administrators and accompanied their patrons on political and military ventures. These patrons included the Amir um, Abdullah Dawa, viziers, including the Shidi uh, uh, Amid and Asahib al Nabad, himself a poet and a possessor of a large library in Ray. These and other senior and provincial officials were active patrons of the intellectual classes. All these gathered together in Shidi, Sunni groups, Zaydis, Ismailis, and Twelvers, Karajites, Christians, and Jews for wide ranging discussions on such varied subjects as poetry, astrology, grammar, and of course the religious sciences. So on one hand, we have a picture in the later sources of complete chaos and sectarian hatred, and on the other hand, something of a cultural revival. So what is the truth of the situation? Well, the historian prefers a fudge, as we say in the West, kind of going somewhere down the middle. It's probably somewhere in between the absolute chaos that some of the sources stretch, and the richness of the spiritual and intellectual discourse and achievement that is attested in these years in the very same time. Both were thus perhaps true, if not necessarily to the extent portrayed by either picture. What is clear, however, is that the authority of those scholars whose names are so well known to us today was not universally acknowledged within the community at the time. And that when things got out of hand, as it were, these scholars were held responsible, as in the case of Mufid, being exiled two, if not three times. Mufid himself had attracted the attention of the Caliph already, he was one of those Shi'i scholars who was forced by the Caliph to sign a document in 1011 denouncing Fatimid claims to being descendants of Ali. But he also came to the attention of other elements in the community. The son and successor of the court-appointed Ali Naqib the Musawi Sayyid Abu Abdullah Muhammad and his son and successor Abu Ahmad engaged al Mufid to teach his sons, Murtaza and Radi. And both of these men in turn succeeded to their father in the post. Mufid is known in the, for his rigorous defense of the faith against such Sunnis, traditionist Ibn al Qalani, the Mutazilite Qadi Abdul Jabbar, Hanafi and Hanbali jurists, Sunni grammarians, and the Zaydis. But he also engaged in very vigorous defense of what became orthodoxy within the community itself. That is, he also faced internal challenges. He received an enormous number of missives from pockets of the faithful scattered across the Abbasid Empire. These questions, when examined, reveal a substantial degree of disagreement across the region over matters which today might be considered rather basic, but which were at the time and can only have been seen as evidence of rather more fundamental splits on matters of doctrine and practice. In any case, it's clear from a close look at his own writings that his views on a wide variety of issues ranging across fiqh to usul of fiqh and theology as well are very much in the minority. But he not only dealt with such issues as replies, he was also today, in today's parlance, proactive. He was proactive. Mufid's magnificent Kitab al Ershad, completed some time before 987-88, and translated into English by my late former colleague at the University of Edinburgh, Dr. Ian Howard, reveals the extent to which Mufid went to rebalance the discourse of the day and refocus it back to basics. Again, as we might say today. In doing so, to some extent, we can say that it helped set the stage for Najib Balogh. Kitabalar Shah is in two volumes, but the all-important first volume is, in, is that in which Mufid deals solely with the life of Imam Ali, his life, but also the manner in which the Prophet relied on the Imam and designated him a successor. What's interesting is that in this work, Mufid draws on accounts, <clears throat> either indirectly or sometimes by explicit citation, from both Sunni and Shi'i sources. Thus, the early biography of Ibn Ishaq, the Waqidi, the historian of Tabari, all Sunnis, as well as, for example, the Iranian Shi'i Abu Faraj and Isfahan, all from the famous uh, Kitab al -Khan. Using Sunni and Shi'i sources, Mufid shows that Ali was the logical choice to be the Prophet's successor. He cites Ali's legal judgments, portrays him as equal to Daud, uh, David, and the legal knowledge, and also cites many of Ali's speeches. His focus on the Imam especially perhaps prefigures the project of Radi, his student, in putting together Najib Allah, as both a statement to the community itself, reminding them as they struggled with and against each other of what they held in common, what it was that bound them together. So Mufid was a scapegoat, the object of official attention, approval and disapproval in his lifetime. And within the community, his views were not always widely accepted. 
Ironically, brother Shirvi from Mutaza, born in 1967, was very much the same. In 1025, as I say, we were told his house was set on fire. He was a student of Mufid, so he would have understood what was happening in the community at the time and would have known of his own teacher's exile from the city by the, by the court. <clears throat> of course, his father lost his post and some of the, into some of the, in some of these, uh, as a result of some of these already mentioned riots and was jailed and had all his property seized by him by a dude of the same, very same Louis de Vere who said to a patronized Mofi. Morteza, by comparison with his teacher, is generally understood as having adopted a more rationalist approach to the understanding and defense of the faith, in which he accorded the traditions sometimes considerably less notice. In fact, he was much more involved, however, with disputes with fellow Twelvers than has been noted to date. Close attention to certain of his works revealed both his efforts, like those of his teacher Mufi, to assert the authority of his views on issues of doctrine and practice, but also close attention to those works reveals the presence within the community across, in the pockets scattered across the Abbasid Empire, of a range of different views on a variety of both doctrinal and practical matters. His correspondence with elements of the community in Hamdan had controlled Mosul, for example. Attested views on doctrines and practice held by the Baghdad elites were not always widely accepted. From Diyar back came a series of queries, including one on the permissibility of Friday prayer, Friday congregational prayer, if someone of whose faith there was uncertainty was the leader of that prayer. In replies to the Mosulites and those in Diyar back on issues to do with homes, we see that Morteza addressed some issues related to the categories of items subject to the tax and to its recipients that might be judged rather basic today. So as with Mufid, a close reading of Morteza's works reviews that his views on these kinds of and many other issues were decidedly within the minority in the community. His very famous 1026 essay on the permissibility of working for the established political institution, dedicated to a 12-year government official with whom he was on close terms, shows his involvement with members of the community engaged in such activity, but himself wrestling with this problem. It does also show that others in the community were very much opposed to such service. Finally, his own use of the Imam's traditions to support part of his arguments suggests that at times he is not, as many Western scholars have suggested, at all reticent to pay attention to the revealed, the revealed traditions. So, we have clear evidence of disputes and or different understandings among the faithful on issues of the Uthmanic Codex of the Quran, on issues relating to Khums and service of the state, and, and many other issues. And we have clear evidence also, even if it's based on sources composed centuries after the events in question, of splits between the elites and the community and other elements, and that the elites, those whom we know today, were those who were made to pay for the confrontational attitudes of these other elements. Both elites and non-elites must have been tearing their hair out over the present, let alone the future, of course, of the community and the future of the faith itself. As to Nantabalaga itself, its compiler, was Mutezla's younger brother, Arazi, a student of Qali Abdul Jabbar, Mutezla's scholars, and a Maliki Fahid who offered, offered him a house at one point. Arazi had the respect of the Caliph of Qadr, for, and for his poetry, that of the uh, vizier Asaf ibn Abad. Arazi held an Aqib post after his father, but then lost it when he refused to apologize to the Abbasid Caliph for an unflattering poem. Indeed, some of his poetry explicitly challenged the legitimacy of both the Umayyads and the Abbasids. He, as others before him, thus we might say today, was not afraid to speak truth to power. But being who he was, Razi, son of an Aqib and student of Mufid, also was certainly aware of the necessity of addressing both Sunni elements, but also the necessity to address the splits within the community itself. This then is my argument. The complex series of external and internal challenges and disagreements was the background against which Rawlsey was asked to and then compiled much of the law. Extraordinary, and what we today could easily classify as existential challenges to the faith, called forth an extraordinary existential response. And that response was the masterpiece that is much of the law. Nearly 250 sermons, 70 letters, nearly 500 sayings of the Imam, on an amazing range of topics. Major problems of metaphysics, theology, fiqh, tafsir, hadith, prophetology, the imam, and ethics, social philosophy, history, politics, administration, civics, science, rhetoric, poetry, and literature. All coming back to the imam himself. In a sense, then, Razi was using this undertaking, this project, 
as a response, an effort to call back the different and sometimes warring segments of the community back to the very basics, to the thing which distinguished them, to distinguish the faithful from others in the community. The understanding that both the political but also the spiritual mantle of the prophet had passed to the imam at the prophet's death. And that as the bearer of that mantle, the imam was the authority in such a range of matters which spanned both doctrine and practice. Muhammad as such, Muhammad Salawat. Muhammad Salawat. Muhammad Salawat. Muhammad Salawat.